Well, it's been one crazy week. Who would agree? It's been <laughs> one of those weeks that, you know, you wake up in the morning and think you've got things under control and all of a sudden something else happens and curveballs come. You know, things come from nowhere and next thing we're busy and because we're heading off to camp, We've had a lot of stuff we've had to do. Maisel's had appointments here and I've needed an MRI and we've needed other stuff and it just keeps on going, but praise God we're here. Praise God in the craziness of a busy world, we can come aside and we can spend some time with each other, with God and be blessed on his Sabbath day. So thank you, thank you for being here. We did take the time yesterday to drive through Lismore. And uh, we had specific needs to, to go and see. Maisel had some needs to go and see a lady that, that owned a shop there in the, in the mall. And uh, the devastation is unbelievable. Lost 90% of her stock, uninsured. And she was telling us a story. She was telling us a story about a young courier driver who had come into her shop to make a delivery. And he said to this lady, how did things go for you in the flood? And she told her story. And all the time this young man is sympathizing with the lady and empathy was raw and real. And after she told her story, he said, she said to the young man, what about you? He said, well, I've lost my home. I've lost my car. He said, all I got out of the flood was three pairs of shorts, three shirts and three pairs of underpants. He said, that's, my, that's all I have. And here, the, the lady was not off so bad. Her home was safe. Her business was affected. And so, yeah, it's just amazing. I, when we drove into Lismore yesterday, I didn't know what to expect. I thought it would just be a ghost town. But I was absolutely amazed to find that I could hardly find a parking place, that people were trading, that people were going about their business, and things were happening. The resilience of people, the patience of people, the love of people, it's just absolutely overwhelming, overwhelming. But just take a moment to look at the big picture the big picture. That's a minor disaster in the context of God. There's a much bigger disaster happening and the whole world is caught up in it. And God is there, going to take care of us and provide for us in a very real way. So let us not forget that, yes, this is a part of life. It's not a good part of life, but it's a part of our world and there's a better one waiting around the corner. Let's just pray. Father God, into your presence we come, thankful that you are an amazing God, thankful that you are watching over all of this and everything that has happened that there are people, services, providers that are out there to alleviate the needs and the pain and the suffering that these natural disasters afflict on people. But Lord, how you must yourself at the moment be looking at the world and saying, well, the world's not what I want it to be, it's a disaster. And how that you are there with compassion and love and providing and, and securing our future. And we thank you for that. So help us to press on through this which involves us, engulfs us now, looking forward to the present day, the future day, when you, dear Lord, will make all things new. What a joy that will be. Bless us, we pray, as we study now your word in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to carry on our journey. Is there a clicker? 
Is there a clicker? <laughs> oh, yep. We did that one well. But what did I do? We've gone black. <laughs> what happened in the process? One more. <laughs> Isn't life sweet? Thank you, Kelly, for our worship program today. Thank you. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're stepping on through the Psalms. Today we've come to, to Psalms 51. In the first 40 thereabouts Psalms, David has drawn from the rich themes of, of the book of Genesis. And he's, he's helped us to understand the greatness, the magnificence, the beauty of God, and, and all that God is. As you shift into Psalms 42, you start to shift into the journey of Exodus. You start to travel into a journey where people are enslaved in captivity and at the core of it all is their sin problem. And their life has been consumed by sin, wickedness and evil. God's people in the book of Exodus are being freed from that, that captivity, that enslavement. And David uses these rich themes of the book of Exodus to help us to understand the sin problem, how ugly it is, how evil it is, and how hurtful it is to God. But how in which... When we understand the sin problem and embrace the plan that God has to rid us of that sin problem, how different our life can be. This is what Psalms 51 is all about. It's one of the, 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 the most heart-wrenching passages in Scripture where a man is being raw, where a man is being honest and letting us into his life. And unfortunately, it's not a place that a lot of people choose to go. Before we look into Psalms 51, we need to go to somewhere else. We need to go to 2 Samuel chapter 12. It's only from the setting in Samuel that we can understand why Psalms 51 has the meaning that it has. For in 2 Samuel chapter 12, there is a parable given to David. Nathan the prophet comes to David and he shares with David a parable. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, reading from verse 1, And he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished, and it grew up together with him, with his children, it ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. Two people, both got sheep. One's got many, one's got one. Verse 4, And a traveller came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So here's this wayfarer. 
Here's the stranger traveling through the land and in culture of which he is living as he has come knocking on that door for some food, for some nourishment. The rich person honors the culture and goes to give this man a meal. But he doesn't kill one of his own sheep. His own sheep are too precious to him. And so he goes and he takes from the poor man this one lamb, the only lamb that he has, and he kills it. He kills it. And David has heard the story and notice the reaction. Verse 5. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man and said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Here's David reacting to the situation and I'm sure you would all have felt exactly the same way as David. That person deserves to be punished and that person deserves to make retribution for what he has done. And in, in an essence, he, he, he puts into place the essence of a death decree. This person doesn't deserve to live. He has been so wicked. And then in verse 7, Then Nathan said to David, You, you are the man. You are the guilty one. You are the one who took that man's little lamb. You are the one who committed the crime. You are the one who committed this great evil. And then Nathan goes on and to talk about how God had blessed David. Verse 7, Nathan said to David, You are the man, thus says the Lord of Israel. I anointed you king of Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you the master's house and your master's wives into your keeping. I gave you all of this stuff. And then in verse 9, Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah and at that moment... David's world has fallen apart. His sin has found him out. And he thought he had escaped retribution. Thought he had escaped punishment. He thought it was done and dusted and forgotten. And that he could move on in life as if nothing happened. Right now, David's mind is taken back to Psalms 19 where he had said and he had used the illustrations that we used last time. Nothing is hidden from the sun. It sees all things. And then he says, and the law of God is just like the sun. Nothing is hidden. God sees all things. And right now, David feels worse than a worm. He just wants to hide. He wants to flee. He has been found out and his guilt overwhelms him. Verse 13. Notice what happens. So David said to Nathan... I have sinned against the Lord. Here is the first moment that David embraces confession for his sins of the past. It's taken a while to catch up with him, but it's caught up with him. And unfortunately, because of his stubbornness, because of his attitude and uh, the mental way 
that he handled the situation, others suffered. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin, and you shall not die. He's put away his sin, and he is no longer condemned to die. Verse 14, However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord, To blaspheme the child also has born to you shall surely die. Then Nathan departed to his house. Wow. Wow. David has just been brought to that moment of reality where his sin has condemned him to death. But then he meets this gracious God who says, you will not die. Unfortunately, people suffered. David's one desire in his life was to build the temple, was to build the sanctuary. But just as Moses was not able to enter into the promised land, because of not listening to the voice of God and doing things his own way, just as sin kept Moses out of the promised land, so too God put restraints on the life of David. And he said to David, Sorry, David, you cannot build the temple. There's too much blood on your hands. You cannot build the temple. Your son can, but sorry, not you, David, not you. So David had to live with that for the rest of his life. And so here in 2 Samuel, we get the story of Nathan and David, and we get the parable of the little lamb. Somewhere the little lamb's not turning up. He must be there somewhere, but that's all right. So here, this becomes the setting It's this incident, this setting that brings David to Psalms 51 and causes David to write Psalms 51, which the essence of is forgiven, that he is forgiven. I did at some time have a, had a media presentation to put in here, but it doesn't pay to upgrade your computers because in the upgrading we lost uh, the media clip, so my apologies. But I don't know of you who have heard the song or the beautiful words of the, of the song Forgiven and uh, how it's so rich in, in meaning. I'll read it to you. I'm the one who held the nail. It was cold between my fingertips. I've hidden in the garden. I've denied you with my very lips. God, I fall down to my knees. With a hammer in my hand, you look at me, arms open. Forgiven, forgiven. Child, there is freedom from all of it. Say goodbye to every sin. You are forgiven. I've done things I wished I hadn't done. I've seen things I wished I hadn't seen. Just the thought of your amazing grace, and I cry, Jesus, forgive me. God, I fall down to my knees with a hammer in my hand. You look at me, arms open. Forgiven, forgiven. Child, there is freedom from all of it. Say goodbye to every sin. You are forgiven. I could have been six feet under. 
I could have been lost forever. Yeah, I should be in that fire, but now there's the fire inside of me. Here I am, forgiven. David, like that man, was able to pen the words there, pen the very thoughts for us in Psalms 51. So here to understand Psalms 51, we need to understand the character of God. David has spent 40 psalms plus helping us to see this, the character of God. How God is gracious, he's merciful, loving kindness. He's full of compassion, compassionate, he's blameless. He creates and renews, he speaks and acts in truth. He restores and sustains and he is a God of deliverance and salvation. David has learnt that is who God is. And then we have the characters of man. And this is the contrast that is given to us in Psalms 51. The character of man is unclean. Man is a transgressor. He's a sinner. He does evil. He's conceived in sin. He's unworthy. And that's all David can say about a a man, about a human being. In comparison of God, that's, that's what we are. And that's where we are. And as Nathan revealed that parable and the meaning of it to him, David realized that that's where he was, that that is who he was. And then he contrasts that with the with the magnificence of God and what a difference we see right there. And as I said earlier on, we need to be understanding the meaning of this text of Psalms 51 in the context of using Psalms 19, that nothing is hidden. Yeah, if my father hadn't seen us hiding the fireworks, we might have got away with it because my father was not God. He didn't know we'd been taking the money. When we had to tell him how he had brought the fireworks, he found out about the money. But up until that point, it was hidden. But in the presence of God, nothing is hidden. Nothing. Nothing. It's known. And so we learn against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Yeah, verse 4 of Psalms 51. David has come to this point that God's right in doing what he does. And all of a sudden, David feels so lost and so hopeless. Yes, it took me a while to realize that by taking that money out of that bottle, that I was sinning against my mother, my sister, and my family who were sacrificing the money to be put in a jar. But David says, yeah, that's only part of the story. The bigger picture is it's been done in the presence of God who has given you and blessed you with that family. And so the reality of it when it sinks deep hurts. It hurt David, hurt David immensely. And so here we now in Psalms 51, we have David's response. Sorry, it's not coming up quite in the middle. We have David's response to the all-knowing, all-seeing creator God. 
And it is mostly, it is mostly honest and simply expressed in verse 3. Have a look at verse 3. For I knowledge, acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Yep, he's realized. He's realized it's there, and there's nothing he can do about it. He's trapped with that problem. And then he goes on, and he paints a beautiful picture of God in verse 17. He says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, broken and contrite heart, O God. You, you, what does it, shall, you will, I'll need to look at it, the text. It's a bit hard on my own piece of paper. A broken and contrite heart, these, O God, you will not despise. So even though we have sinned, even though we have been caught up in sin, if we come to God in surrender, submission, confession, God will not despise it. To wipe away sin, that's all we need to do. We need to come with a broken spirit. We need to let go of who we are and we need to embrace God. We need to have a broken and contrite heart and God will not despise us. And David is allowed to live on. David is allowed to serve God. This is what it means by being having a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. All idea of our own importance is gone, let go, given up. David thought he was the, the, the king. He thought he was the most important and he could get away with whatever he wanted to do. Not even the king can have his own agenda. It's got to be focused on God. All idea of our own importance is gone. Frivolity and trifling have gone from us. It's no good messing on the, on the edge of things. No good being all the way. It's important to be all the way and not half the way. Frivolity and trifling has to be gone. Hypocrisy has to be gone. Here's David trying to tell the kingdom what to do when he himself is not doing what, the king, what he wanted the kingdom to do. Hypocrisy has to be put away. And unfortunately, it's on that line that most of us fall up. Most of us fall on the fact that we, we're in some way hypocritical. We quite often will say, do this, and we don't do it ourselves. We need to be very careful in that area that we're not in any way hypocritical. All the secrets and essences have flowed, have flowed out. David was harboring them, and there was no healing until they flowed out. He tried to do these things in secret, hid them from man, but couldn't hide them from God. What's the signs of repentance? Deeply regret that we have sinned. Deeply regret that we have sinned against a God so great. That's the first sign of repentance. As we see ourselves so small but God so great and we come to him with deep regret for what we have done against him. And then like David, we need to mourn 
that we have offended, that we have again offended against so excellent and an admirable law. David knew it all. He's writing the Torah and the Psalms. He knows the law. He knows what was there. But he had sinned against it and he mourns that he had offended the law of God. And then the third point is grieve that we have sinned against the Saviour's love. So those are the three things that leads us and indicates to us that we are on that journey of repentance. David goes through all of these steps and they're very evident in Psalms 51. He deeply regrets what he has done. He mourns for the offence and he's grieved that he's offended God. Look what he says as a result of this in Psalms 51.11. Look what he says here. Psalms 51.11. Do not cast me from, do not cast me away from your presence. Do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. David desires to stay in the presence of God, having sinned so great. But he knows there's only one way that he can stay there. And that is if God does not take his Holy Spirit from him. And that's how we need to go through life, folks. We need to be able to, like David, plead that God does not cast us away and that he does not take from us the Holy Spirit's. God's presence is experienced through the Holy Spirit. Experienced through the Holy Spirit. And so as we draw from Psalms 51, we learn these things on how to overcome sin. Psalms 51 is a beautiful passage in how to understand how to overcome sin. And the first thing we must do is not sin against the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit convicts us, as the Holy Spirit teaches, as the Holy Spirit takes us on a journey, we must at any point, we must not at any point say, ah, I'm not going there. Even though it's where the Spirit wants us to go, we, may, we must not rebel against the leading of that Spirit. And then we must set our sin in the light of God's countenance. If God were not here, being who he is, and I'm over here in my sin, if God were not there, my sin matters nothing. If God were not in the picture, sin does not matter. But only when God is there, do I see what my sin is and understand the nature of my sin? So we must always set our sin in the countenance of God. And then you'll have an understanding of what sin is about and how ugly God sees sin. We must set sin in the light of your marvelous experiences. You know, there are times in life when things are good. David, as a shepherd boy, was blessed by God and had an amazing experience. And God was taking him to beautiful places and ultimately put him on the throne. God was blessing. And David was having this marvelous experience, but sin robs him of that. Sin robs him of that experience. Sin robs him of that joy. 
And so, yes, we must, well, what, if, if, if I wasn't committing this sin, where would God be taking me? How would God be blessing me? Where would God be leading me if I was to get away and take away the sin? So it's sin that holds us back from experiencing the delight and the joy of this beautiful God, and David knew that. Think of how you have done injury to others by your example. Nathan reminded David that it's not all about him. The baby died because of his foolishness, because of his sin. Other people suffered because of his sin. Think of the injury that our actions could be causing to someone else, and when we see that, we won't want to do it. But not many of us stop to think about that situation. Think of all the opportunities we lose whenever we fall into sin. Think about the consequences. Think about it. What's going on here? Think of your sins in the light of the glory of God. And so David has been brought to this point. He's doing all of this. And as he's looked at his sinfulness and his ugliness, he then says some things. And I just want to have you look at what he does. The significant words that David utters as he has contemplated the ugliness of his sin in the presence of this holy God. And he he says to God, oh, sorry, they're a bit hard to see. He pleads to God and he says, hide your face from my sin is supposed to be in that corner. So one of the first things that that God asks of David is, David, I know you see everything, but hide your face from my sin. In other words, block it out. He goes on to say, I have sinned. He goes on to say, purify me. He goes on to say, renew a steadfast spirit within me. He says, sustain me. He says, be gracious to me. He says the phrase, blot out twice. Blot him out, God. Blot him out. You can do it. He says, make me to hear. Are we all listening today? Are we all listening to God? Because God's speaking. God's talking to every one of us. God's directing and wanting to direct all of our lives. But David says, please, God, make me to hear. Open my ears. Help me to listen to you, God. I might be much the wiser of you. And then he comes to this kind of language. Do not take from me. God was entitled to. God had the freedom to. God had the ability to, to take everything from David. And so David says, please God, don't take from me, but instead restore to me. Oh God, I've stepped out of the the presence of you, the righteous one. And you are, you are, you are entitled to do what your word has told me, but please, God, don't take it from me. Please, God, don't. Restore me, God. Restore me. And here, look at this language. Wash me. Twice. He pleads with God to wash him. And then in the same context, he uses the phrase, cleanse me, cleanse me. David knew by this time 
that even the slightest bit of righteousness that he had was only filthy rags. And had he needed his garment, has needed his vessel to be washed, he needed it to be cleansed. Create in me, he says. Deliver me, he says. What a beautiful God. For David realized that God could do all of that. God could turn his face on his sin and not condemn him. God could save him. What a God. What a wonderful God. And that is the God that David found. That's the God that David met. Beautiful, isn't it? And so in the end of it all, David could say, I'm forgiven. What a joy that must have been to David's heart. What a release it must have been to him to have been so close to destruction, to being separated, because he had already passed his own death sentence upon himself. When he said to Nathan, that, that person who took that little lamb from that man, that person deserves to die. That, de that person deserves just punishment. And David was saying to Nathan, whoever did that deserves, deserves the punishment. And then Nathan says, hey, mate, it's you. It's you, David. Wake up to yourself, son. It's you. You've done that great evil and that you took Uriah the Hittite's wife. You did it. You did it. And he could say, he could say, I have been forgiven. I have been forgiven. Verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. He despises our sin but he does not despise us when we desire to return to him, surrender to him, submit to his will. He will bless us. He goes on to say in verse 18, Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and a whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. Yes. Coming to this point is a point of coming to receiving the blessings of God. David did end up receiving those blessings of God. Unworthy as he was, God accepted him, God forgave him, and God blessed him. I pray that that's your experience with God. Yep, after I felt that stick around my bottom all those years ago, I felt the wrath of my father. But I'm so thankful that I don't need to experience the wrath of God. I'm so thankful that God is willing to listen to us, is willing to have us confess, is willing to come into his presence and seek his forgiveness. And God accepts that sorry and God makes us and allows us to be forgiven. What a beautiful God. We'll hand over now to our praise and worship team just to close off. Thank you. Next time I share, 
from the Psalms, which will be after camp. I'm going to take you to a very interesting psalm. And if you want to, you're willing in the meantime to, to have a look at it. It's Psalms 73. It's not written by David. It's written by quite a unique individual. His name is Asaph. He's got a very mediocre role to play in life society. He's the person who has been commissioned to polo, polish the instruments of the, of, the, of the orchestra. And he's the custodian of the instruments in the sanctuary. But the issues of the world overwhelm him and he becomes very confused as to whether it's a good thing being a servant of God and faithfully following God. Psalm 73 is all about that struggle and that journey. It's a fascinating one, and that's where we'll go next time. So if you want to read Psalm 73 in the meantime, you go there, and it'll be a Loving blessing. Father, I hope Nathan never has to come knocking on our door to remind us of our sin, to remind us of what we have done that has caused great pain and suffering to you and to others. And I'm just so thankful that when Nathan did come to David to confront David with the reality of where he was, that David was able to be led by your spirit to a place of confession and reconciliation. Thank you that you love us that much, that you will do that for us. May we accept your counsel of warning to us that sin's not a pretty thing. It's an ugly thing. It causes pain and suffering. It causes hurt. And so I just pray, dear Lord, that you will strengthen us and you will help us not to have to deal with sin the way that David did, but to be able to say that a gracious God has forgiven us and blessed us. Take us from this place today, ever blessed in your presence, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.